Welcome back, everyone, from the break. Uh, what a fantastic day we've had. What fantastic talks this afternoon. Um, just so enjoyable. And now we get, um, you know, yet another uh, beautiful opportunity to uh, spend some time with Jim Simons and Mark Tessé Levine, uh, who are old friends and who will talk with us about um, effective philanthropy for promoting innovative translational research. And it's my pleasure to introduce both of them very briefly. Jim Simons is a mathematician by training and by passion. He was an undergrad at MIT, PhD, UC Berkeley. He is famous within mathematics for things I don't pretend to understand, except that they were contributions to really uh, interesting areas of geometry and topology, and they earned him an international prize in geometry. Uh, he was a faculty member at SUNY Stony Brook for 10 years, chairman of the mathematics department elected to membership in the National Academy of Sciences, but he wasn't satisfied with these accomplishments. Jim began a new career in the business world, creating Renaissance technologies, which ultimately became one of the most successful investment firms in the world. Most of us know of Jim and his wife, Marilyn, primarily because of the Simons Foundation, uh, which they founded in 1994 to advance education, health, and scientific research. And one of their flagship programs at the foundation has been SFARI, the Simons Foundation uh, for Autism Research, uh, which many uh, investigators here at Stanford have contributed to and benefited from. Uh, the Simons Foundation in the past seven, eight years has started many other really novel and interesting scientific initiatives, including the Flatiron Institute for Computational Science in New York, and notably, uh, one that many of us here at Stanford are involved in is the Simons Collaboration on the Global Brain. Uh, Mark Tessy Levine needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, he's Canadian by birth, edu undergrad educated in physics at McGill. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, PhD, University College London, and was a faculty member at UCSF and Stanford for many years before going on to Genentech, where he became chief scientific officer ultimately. Mark is a world leader in the study of brain development, still is, has a lab here at Stanford. He was president of Rockefeller University and from 2011 to 2016 and became the 11th president of Stanford, only the 11th, uh, in 2016. When he made that decision, I don't think he bargained for COVID-19. None of us did. But he is leading us steadfastly and he is carrying a burden on all of our behalf that I can only imagine. Uh, so thank you, Mark, so much for all you do for us. Thank you for your service to the university and take it away. Great, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Bill, for that very kind introduction and, and thank you for your leadership, uh, both of the, the Institute uh, and also for organizing this uh, wonderful symposium together with your co-organizers. Um, it's, uh, it, it's really a wonderful opportunity to, to be able to focus on science um, and uh, I think for our community, especially in these difficult times, that, that is a great gift. Um, it's also uh, for me a great pleasure to be here today to reconnect with an old friend, uh, uh, Jim Simons, uh, and uh, to have the, the, this opportunity. I feel very honored to be able to, uh, to interview uh, uh, Jim and engage him in conversation uh, on behalf of our uh, neuroscience community here uh, at Stanford. Uh, so, so Jim, perhaps I can can just uh, start. Um, uh, you know, you and Marilyn have acquired uh, really an international reputation as far-sighted philanthropic investors uh, in a number of areas, including in translational research in the biomedical field. Um, what uh, some people may not have known, although uh, uh, Bill has just given a wonderful introduction to this, uh, but they may not have known before that that your first love is actually mathematics. And so before we get into philanthropy, before we get into neuroscience and, and biomedical research, um, I, I'd love to start uh, by asking you about your love for mathematics, um, uh, which I know uh, uh, influences um, uh, uh, you, you know, it, you, your understanding of how it influences all of science. Maybe you could tell us about your personal journey uh, and the, the, the place that mathematics has occupied in your life uh, as you've gone on to so many other things. Okay, well, uh, I always liked mathematics since I was a little kid. Um, I, uh, I loved it. And uh, well, you know, I went to elementary school and high school, and then I went to MIT 
And but the only thing I wanted to do at MIT is uh, is study math, and uh, they sort of let me do that. So, but I graduated in three years, and then stayed another year as a graduate student, and uh, that was fine. But they told me you ought to go and work with Chern, who was the most famous geometer of his day. And Chern had just come from University of Chicago to Berkeley. And they said, I should go to Berkeley. So I said, fine, I got a nice fellowship. And I went to Berkeley only to discover that Chern was celebrating his first year at Berkeley by having a sabbatical. So he wasn't there. Uh, but <laughs> I found another guy to work with and that was, was very good. <clears throat> In my second year there, I was giving a seminar to beginning of that year and this tall Chinese guy walks in. So I said to the person next to me, who's that? He said, that's Churn. I said, Churn? I had no idea he was Chinese. If his name had been Chen or Chan, I would have known, but, uh, and I'd never seen a picture of him, but uh, it was Churn, all right. And we became very good friends in my second year there. And I, I finished up that year and uh, came back to teach it at MIT then uh, and, and Harvard. And uh, well, I got involved with a certain set of questions uh, called minimal surfaces or minimal varieties. Uh, that's a surface or a higher dimensional surface that has minimal area or volume with respect to its boundary. So like if you take a, a a wire frame circle, something, dip it in soap suds, take it out, there'll be a surface that it spans it. And that surface is less area than any other surface. So I got very interested in that area and um, spent, I didn't write another paper after my thesis for almost five years, but it was worth the wait because uh, the wait, because I, I really learned a lot about uh, figured out a lot about these minimal surfaces and minimal varieties. And uh, that was part of the reason that I, I won a prize. But then I, uh, then I went to Stony Brook to chair the mathematics department. And um, it, it had a great physics department, but uh, this was in uh, 1968 but it didn't have a good math department. So at 30 years old, they invited me to come and be chair and build the department. And uh, they had a lot of money because Rockefeller was governor and the state was flush and Rockefeller loved the state university. So anyway, we, we built a very good mathematics department. And at the same time, I started on another project, math project, and it, I won't give the details, but it was, it was very interesting. And it came out, it had something to do with three-dimensional manifolds. And I showed this to Chern and he said, oh, well, we could do this in all dimensions. I said, we can? He said, yes. So I started working with Chern and together we uh, came up with something that's now called uh, Chern Simons theory or Chern Simons invariance. And uh, it, it was, you know, I was very happy with the mathematics, but it turns out it's become applied to physics, all kinds of physics. So uh, condensed matter physics, string theory, there's even something called Chern Simons gravity. So uh, I didn't know any physics. So it's one of those things, you know, but you do something in science and you never know when it, where it's gonna go. And in this case, it went from math to physics. So, but at a certain point, as you said, or I, I guess, Bill, I was getting frustrated and thought I'd do something different. And so I started a hedge fund, um, which was very uh, quantitative. And it was, it was a, a, a very, very good success. And I made a lot of money. Uh, and at a certain point, I decided to step down from that and go and work in our foundation. We had established a foundation 
And so I'm the chair of the foundation and uh, we focus on, uh, on science, science and mathematics. And uh, it's great. So that's, that's my math background. Well, th thanks, Jim. And before we, we move on to the foundation, I, I should say uh, my understanding is that the, the churn simons theory um, you know, crops up in papers pretty much every week in, in, in physics now, in, in all the different fields that you, you discussed. So from what was perhaps an esoteric mathematical problem, uh, now this is something that, that really has been a profound enabler of many other fields. Um, and uh, uh, and also, uh, yeah. it, uh, I understand you, you still do some math on the side still in your spare time. Well, uh, up until uh, six or seven years ago, I, I did, but uh, I'm 82 now. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we do a lot of collaborations at yeah. the foundation. One of them is just starting and it's called uh, uh, the plasticity in the aging brain. And it's trying to understand what happens to our brains as we age. And I'm very interested in that because my brain is definitely going downhill. So um, uh, maybe we can find something uh, That's to right. correct that. We'll, 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 we'll get you something soon. The, uh, the, um, uh, uh, I should say it, for the, the, the students in the audience, uh, you know, I think it's very inspiring to see how you pursued your passion, uh, but you kept an open mind and, and went to, on to new challenges, but never leaving behind uh, what you were interested in, in in the first place. And I, I think that's that can be a great model uh, for our students who are thinking about where their their PhD training might take them in the future. Um, if we, we turn to the to um, uh, SFARI, uh, the Simons Foundation uh, uh, Autism Research Initiative, uh, that was your, your first major venture in, in translational research. It's given up more than 200 million to more than uh, dollars to more than 150 different organizations since 2007. Uh, can you just uh, tell us what led you to create Safari, um, how you set it up to be an effective organization, and then maybe what you think its most six significant successes have been? Okay, well, we got interested in, um, in autism because we have a child with autism. She's doing quite well, uh, actually. Uh, she's now married and has a husband and uh, she's doing fine, but she, she is definitely autistic. So we got interested in that, Marilyn and I. Uh, Columbia, someone at Columbia said, oh, give us $10 million and we'll put up an institute to study autism. And I said, well, maybe we better learn a little bit more about where the field is before we start setting up institutes. So we had a roundtable discussion. Uh, uh, Paul Greengard headed it. Uh, and uh, there were some people who worked in autism and other people who didn't. And what we came away learning was that two things. First, it's highly genetic. If one twin, identical twin has autism, it's 90% that the other one is gonna have autism. So it's, uh, it's highly genetic. And two, with very few exceptions, the people working in the field were not especially good. So we thought, okay, that's what we should do. We'll focus on genetics and, uh, and try to get people into the field. And uh, so we gave a few grants. I was doing that at the time. And uh, uh, two of them didn't pan out. But one panned out wonderfully. That was from a guy named Mike Wiggler at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And uh, he um, found many, many uh, copy number variations in, in people with autism. And uh, 10 times as many as there would be in normal people. So it was clear that something was going on there genetically and but i thought at a certain point i wanted to give out more grants and marilyn pointed out that what did i know about giving out grants which was absolutely true so we found someone who uh so i wanted to find a uh do a search and find 
someone who would come to a, the foundation and uh, do that. And uh, so I asked Paul Nurse to be on the search committee and Harold Varmus to be on the search committee. And then this guy knew slightly, Jerry Fishback. I thought he might be good. And the other two said yes, that he would be good on the search committee. So I had a pastrami sandwich with him the next weekend and we started talking. And the more I talked about this, the more excited he seemed to be getting. And he had just stepped down from a uh, dean uh, at Columbia Medical School. And I said, do you want this job? And he said, I think I do. And he did. So he came to us and he knew how to make grants and he knew all, all that stuff. And uh, so, uh, so we called it Safari, as Simon's Foundation for Autism Research. And um, uh, it worked out wonderfully. So he was the first scientist to join the foundation and he brought others to be on his team and Mike, and he designed a, a collection. It's called the Simon Simplex, Simplex Collection. And it's, <coughs> it's, it's people with autism and their parents and they have to have at least one sibling without autism. And, and no other sibling with it. Because he was looking for de, de novo mutations. A de novo, well, you know what a de novo mutation is, but it's something that's not inherited. Uh, but it just, uh, you know, uh, it it's, comes from, it, it's in the sperm or it's in the mother's egg or something, it's, but it's not in either of the genomes of the parents. And uh, so, and we found a lot of, so it was a, a big collection. Uh, it's, it's called the Simon Simplex Collection. Simplex, because there was only one uh, child. And that was a very useful thing. It's still you being used for papers, studying the genetics of autism. So uh, Wiggler was, uh, was a terrific um, colleague. And so, have I answered your question? Because I could keep so, going. So at this point, uh, Jim, do we uh, do you feel that uh, with the knowledge that's been gained through those studies and, and other studies, um, uh, do you feel that we still need to gain more knowledge? Do you think we're at a point where uh, we can make a difference in terms of, of you know seeking treatments and, and therapeutics? Right. Uh, good question. And I think the answer is yes on both counts. I think we still need to do some more basic research in this subject, but we're at a point where we want to become, start doing translational stuff. We have a, uh, a trial underway, which I have meaningful hopes for. It turns out that um, many, many people with uh, autism have uh, an EI imbalance. So every neuron is either excitatory or inhibitory, as you, you well know. And um, the, uh, there, are far, there are fewer inhibitory neurons, but they have a far reach and they're very important. And it turns out that uh, maybe a majority of people with autism have an imbalance. And that imbalance is that the, the inhibitory neurons really aren't doing their job. It's, uh, they produce something called GABA, and that GABA is, uh, goes to the, to, to the next, uh, to the next uh, neuron. And so we have something, and, and there are two receptors for GABA A and GABA B. So we have a drug that is a GABA B agonist, which means that it will, uh, do the GABA B receptor, it'll juice it up. And so maybe counteract the fact that uh, the GABA is not doing such a good job. So now we have a trial um, uh, just starting. Uh, it's gotten held up because of COVID and everything. But um, one mouse model, when we only looked at one mouse model, uh, it was very effective in a mouse model uh, of that particular uh, thing so we're, we're but we really feel it's time to look at other kinds of treatments 
and in fact, we're another. Jerry stepped down seven years ago. We hired a fellow named Louis Reichardt, uh, who's a very good scientist. You probably know of Louis, and he stepped down, and we're we now have someone who will head this. We think he's almost accepted, but he is more on the translational side, although he knows a lot of basic science. So uh, that's probably the turn we're, we're going to take. Autism is an extremely variegated condition. Uh, there are so many different flavors of autism. No one thing, no one treatment is going to be help everybody. But uh, but there it is, and uh, so we're, we're taking that turn. So you're going to continue then with with both um, funding additional basic science into the the, the causes of autism, uh, uh, while at the same time pursuing leads in the clinic um, that might yes. be helpful. Yes, I don't want to stop doing doing that basic research because there's a lot we still don't understand about the causes. Um, but um, so we'll do that. So that we, we do a lot of science in the foundation, but uh, autism has been, we spend about $90 million a year on that, uh, in that field. And uh, well, hopefully it'll bear fruit. So, so help us understand sort of the range of, of topics beyond autism that you've uh, focused on. You, 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 you have, You've invested in exciting areas from the origins of life to yep. ocean processes and ecology, and and notably, and, and Bill mentioned this also, um, you you've created and invested generously in the Simons Collaboration for the Global Brain. Um, the it's, so at first it, it's sort of interesting to see what you've chosen to focus on in general. So maybe we can talk about that, but also uh, help us understand what led you to create the the uh, collaboration for the global brain, and and what what you think it's what the, the impact is that it's having? Well, it seems uh, this started about, uh, I think it's in its seventh year. Uh, it's, um, it's going very well. Uh, what I wanted to understand was the brain, not just uh, the parts of the brain, uh, but but the sort of the whole thing, that's the global notion. Uh, we, there's so many things we, we don't know. We, know. we know what all the parts are, but, uh, but how do they you know, really fit together and, and, and what's, what's going on? Uh, we don't know how memories are encoded and stored. We don't know how memories are retrieved. But we're getting closer. Uh, David Tank, do you know who David Tank is? Certainly. Uh, David heads this, this global brain. And I was complaining to him the other day, well, we don't know about this. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We do know something. And he started giving me a lecture on what we do know about how memory is stored. And I was, I was very happy to hear that. So, um, but we have wonderful people working on this uh, in universities all around the country. And uh, so that's a collaboration that we do. And you're right, we do the origins of life. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to know, you know, where we all came from? That's a very tough one, but we're making some progress on that. Um, and so th that's life science. We have many in, in uh, math and physical science, many collaborations. And they're, so th that's a, a way, I don't think other foundations do this, um, but uh, I like people working collaboratively and um, together. So we have, uh, I think we have 18 math and physical sciences collaborations. Happily, math and physical science is much cheaper than life science. So, uh, <laughs> So those collaborations are much less expensive, but uh, but they're they're very interesting. They're very interesting. We would, one that I was just in a meeting on is a a, a no a novel way to make fusion. Uh, no one's ever been able to make a fusion 
reactor that doesn't take more energy than it gives off. Uh, but these guys uh, think they're onto something, and I think they're onto it too. That uh, they, it's a somewhat different design, and but there's a lot of mathematics that went into it. It's called hidden symmetries, and uh, it's. I think we have a a pretty good chance of coming up with a fusion reactor that gives out more energy than it takes in. So it would be a great boon to, in uh, from a sustainability point of view uh, to have a, a new energy source like that. Oh my goodness, yes, yes. If we have fusion, uh, it would be it would be terrific. Uh, and we do uh, astronomy. We have a big telescope array going up in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And uh, that's in the telescope array in the microwave frequency. And what we hope to learn is about something called inflation. The theory is that the universe sort of stat started with a big bang at a point, more or less. And within millionths of millionths of millionths of a second, it expanded tremendously to uh, you know, form the universe. Now, if it did that, if that's the case, then it would have created gravitational waves called primordial gravitational waves. That big bang would have caused those waves. Now, they're not very strong, but they supposedly exist. So our telescope project will discover them if they do exist. But if they don't exist or if we can't find them, and we have very delicate instrumentation on this, if we can't find it, then uh, it's kind of back to the drawing board, which wouldn't displease me. I mean, if we find it, everyone gets a Nobel Prize because it's a very, very big issue. But um, I wouldn't cut it, but uh, the, the guys who do the telescope. But um, it doesn't, it, it bothers me that time had a beginning. Uh, it, does, it doesn't seem reasonable. I mean, it, it doesn't have an end. We don't imagine well, time will stop after a while. Why should it have ever started? So uh, there's a guy named Paul Steinhardt at Princeton who has a, a model of an oscillating universe. And he's extremely smart. And uh, so we have a little, we're funding him a little bit. But this is a universe that expands and then contracts uh, and then bounces back, and it goes. It goes through this. But without circle. going, but without going down to a point. Sort of without stops. going down to a point. Yes, so it's no, a soft. No gravitational waves then. Exactly, there will be no gravitational waves from that. So, uh, so we have a lot of collaborations, and uh, and we do a lot of grants, and so it, it's great. You you once told me um, that you 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 thought the two biggest questions are. How do our brains work, and what are the origins of the universe? And so that's where you you put your money then with the global Absolutely. collaboration and with these telescopes looking for the the origins of the universe. Yep, exactly right. Those I think how the brain works is such a great problem, and it's going to take us a long time, I think, to figure it out. But we will figure it out. We will. We have functional descriptions of pretty much every other part of the body the kidneys, the heart, we can build these things because we know how they work. Skin, uh, we know like how the eyes work. We could make an artificial eye. It would be pretty expensive and so on. But in principle, we could make an eye or even an ear. But we couldn't make a brain because we don't know how it works. So we wouldn't just glue a lot of uh, you know, neurons together and say, okay, there's a brain because it's just not gonna, nothing's going to happen. So um, it's a terrific problem, a wonderful problem. So before I, I hand it over to Bill to, for, to ask questions from the audience, then this is a, a great place to just bring it back to the current audience um, and uh, the current audience of uh, you know, current generations and coming generations of, of neuroscientists, lots of, of trainees here today, students and, and postdoctoral fellows. Um, how would you challenge uh, uh, all of uh, us neuroscientists, but especially the, the younger generation, to think about their work uh, in relation to the goals that matter most to you? 
Well, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, well, what, what, well or, or maybe I can just say what 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 uh, advice or what challenges would you you give to um, to the this generation of neuroscientists? Well, I think the same challenge I would give to uh, uh, people in other other fields, but neuroscience is a, is a great field, of course. Um, you just have to you have to work hard, uh, and uh, a friend of mine uh, liked to say. Uh, Bad ideas is good. Good ideas is better. No ideas is terrible. And when you're doing science, you're going to have a lot of bad ideas because they just don't work out. But you have to uh, just keep at it and uh, just keep at it. And you'll, you'll come up with some good ideas. Yes. And that goes for science of all sorts. So um, people... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd heard the the um, uh, the saying, a similar saying, uh, Jim, that uh, the best way to have a good idea is to start with a lot of ideas. Um, so I think you're you're saying something similar. Yes. To try a lot something of very, very very similar. Most of the ideas don't work. Okay, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah then you yeah, need a pruning uh, mechanism, right? Yes, exactly. So, pruning mechanism. That's right. So uh, Stanford's a wonderful place, and uh, I'm sure uh, there are a lot of young people there who will become neuroscientists and uh it's a great field and stick with it that's my advice great well maybe, maybe i'll hand it now over to bill to to moderate you know questions from the audience good Fine. good uh thank you uh for that discussion jim uh, we have a, a few interesting questions coming in here. There's a, a theme to two or three of them, but I'll just start with this one. Uh, what is the best way to sh ensure that philanthropic funding is effective, especially if the funder does not have a background in the particular field that they're that they're funding? So, uh, you know, you've you've been extraordinarily you and Marilyn have been extraordinarily generous in your philanthropy, and and how do you how do you in, maximize your chances of getting good return on your investment there? Well, that's a good question. Um, we have a scientific advisory board in each area that we're working in math and physics, in autism and so on. And these are very distinguished scientists and they, you know, look over our shoulders and say, you know, and advise us on, uh, you know, Maybe you ought to point slightly in the other direction or whatever. But, uh, uh, but we do have scientists on staff. And uh, so how do you recognize that something is, is, is really going to be very good or is very good? And I, I think a little bit, I don't, I don't think there's any way to uh, measure it so well. But uh, it used to be said that pornography, the definition of pornography was, you know it when you see it. And that's the way I feel about good science. You know it when you see it. So, but we do have, have a, all these advisors and that, that's been very helpful. Good. And, and so a related question here, Jim, is um, about the Flatiron Institute, but it, it goes somewhat along the same line. It says, do you, it's from Zach Chandler, do you attempt to align work being done in the Flatiron Institute with the extramural research that you fund through these other granting programs? So Flatiron is, is inside the Simons Foundation. It's, it's intramural, we would say. Um, and does having your own, how does having your own research programs advance the goals of the foundation? So what's the, what's the unique role of the Flatiron being intramural? And is there synergy between the Flatiron and all of these extramural fascinating things you're funding? That's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, the, the uh, Flatiron Institute uh, focuses on computational science. So we have computational biology, we have computational astrophysics, we have computational uh, quantum physics, which is sort of material science. And uh, actually we have uh, quantitative, com no, computational, computational science. Did I say quantitative? Computational science, computational astrophysics, et cetera. And computational mathematics is the fourth unit. And we're just starting the fifth one 
which is computational neuroscience. Now, it's good to have those guys around because uh, they do help us in the grant making area to a certain extent because uh, they know those fields. Uh, but no grants come out of uh, the good thing about Flatiron Institute, if you work there, is you don't have to apply for grants because we support all the research. So, uh, and sign me up. Okay, <laughs> if you if you want to you want to join, speak to Hero. You'll you're one of his heroes, so I'm sure he would be happy to have you on board. And we can also hire uh, uh, computer people and uh, programmers. Uh, university departments can't have uh, full-time programmers, at least I don't believe, in, in their departments. So a lot of the programming is done by graduate students and postdocs, and then they leave, and there's no one to support the code, and it might not be such good code anyway. So we have a fair number of programmers in every unit, and really good programmers. So, um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the people on the other side of the street, there are there are scientists there who are giving these grants, uh, you know, hang out with the people from Flatiron. And I, I think it's a good mixture. Yeah. I mean, I can say from my own personal experience with the Simons Foundation, I've had the privilege of being you know, on the executive committee of the collaboration on the global brain, as you well know, that the resources at the Flatiron are, you know, we're still trying to figure out how uh, we could best uh, interface with the Flatiron to advance the goals both of the collaboration on the global brain and the Flatiron. And I think that Arrow, who you just referred to coming in to head up your last computational unit at Flatiron and neuroscience will be a big key to that puzzle. I think we all sense that there's some potential there that um, we haven't realized yet. And I'm looking forward to seeing how we get that done. So here's a question for you. Um, is there a way to calculate or estimate the impact of an investment prior to investing? <laughs> um. uh, <laughs> well, uh, I guess you're talking about, I assume he is talking about financial investments. You know, he doesn't say specifically. Uh, oh. It's, it's, it doesn't say specifically whether it's, uh, I, think it's, I think there's an intention here to let you take that question in any direction you want to. Well, okay. Well, first I'll take it in the financial direction. Um, the way we uh, invest at, uh, at Renaissance is uh, we build all kinds of models of, uh, of, the, of the markets and, and how stocks behave. And, uh, and we, we get little predictive signals uh, that, that just have a little edge to them. They're right, maybe. 52, 53% of the time. And we have a whole lot of them, a lot of them. And we keep coming up with more and more predictive signals. And that seems to, uh, that seems to work. Now, uh, so in, in investing in science, um, well, I hope, I, I expect the people on staff who give grants have good taste and uh, give grants to good people. And uh, good people is the, is the core thing. If, if you, you know this guy is very good, he's more likely to do something, you know, invest in him or her, uh, they're more likely to do something than someone who is not so good. So you need good taste, you need good taste. It's really interesting, Jim, what you say about the uh, percentages, you know, 2% here, 3% there. Um, it's kind of the opposite of the Silicon Valley ethos, right? Where you're scattering money around and looking for the unicorns. You know, you don't care if 19 out of 20 fail as long as that 20th one scores big. And it's, uh, it's never occurred to me before, but it seems like it's almost, almost, the, almost the opposite. Almost, yes. Yeah, but out of those little two and three percent, Renaissance became a unicorn. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it did. It's it's the most successful hedge fund ever, I think. Yeah. So far, so good. 
Mark, here's a question for you. Um, you know, Jim and Marilyn have started many new initiatives, but Stanford and Rockefeller have started many new initiatives as well. And the question for you is how does Stanford measure the success of a new initiative? And you're gonna be starting some more under the long range vision here over the next few years. How do you measure success? The, the uh, and we have uh, here, uh, so at Rockefeller, we started a number of initiatives. Uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, TDI, the Tri-Institutional Discovery Institute. Um, and, uh, you know, here at Stanford in our long range plan, we've started a number of initiatives as well. The, the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the Innovative Medicines Accelerator, the, the Public Impact Labs. Um, so uh, a number of things are being started. And of course, in, in past years before I arrived here, you know, the Neuroscience Institute would be a, a great example. The, I think in terms of looking, you know, how do we measure success for initiatives like those? So first is, is having a very clear idea of, of what the, 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 the mission is of the, the um, initiative or institute. Uh, what are you trying to achieve? Um, ideally, having uh, some metrics that go uh, with that. And the metrics can be, um, uh, uh, and it depends what you're, you're trying to do for something like the Innovative Medicines Accelerator that we have uh, that uh, Chetan Koshla uh, is uh, currently uh, directing and getting off the ground. Uh, the aim there is to uh, uh, facilitate, to democratize, um, uh, if you will, for our, our faculty members access to infrastructure and tools that enable them to take their um, uh, biological target that they wanna make a, a therapeutic to and develop a drug prototype against uh, that target, whether it's a small molecule or an antibody um, or uh, an anti-sense uh, drug or something like that, uh, to take it to the prototype stage, something that uh, 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 most uh, biologists uh, don't have the, um, the training to do or the, the infrastructure uh, but to enable them to do that. So there you could have some very clear metrics on the number of projects that have progressed from you know, start to having prototypes. Uh, obviously the prototypes that um, uh, lead to uh, greater things beyond that um, uh, would be another metric. Uh, so uh, a clear idea of the mission, a clear idea of metrics that might be very tangible as in that example, or might be different if you're, the Institute is more focused on uh, stimulating a certain area of science, uh, then the metrics will be in terms of the number of discoveries and publications and 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 uh, other things uh, that come up. The the trainees who come out of the institutes uh, and launch their own careers in in that field and help build the field. So, clarity around the mission, clarity around the metrics, and then um, uh, I, I just want to go back to Jim's last point: hiring the very best people. You know they. The success of any one of these initiatives is always dependent on terrific leadership. Uh, for us in the university, that means faculty leadership. So identifying the faculty um, who, uh, together with colleagues, because it's it's uh, never a, a solo sport, it's always a team sport, but who will help lead uh, the initiative is very important. And that's another metric uh, that you can hold the administration accountable for, uh, which is making sure that the, the right people are put in place and then empowered uh, to do the work. Uh, so metrics around you know, the, the resources that uh, we help the institutes um, uh, garner uh, in order to, to, to get things off the ground. So there, there are multiple ways in which you have to, 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 to measure progress and success, but it, it's very important to be very clear about what you're trying to achieve. I might add that um, uh, our supporters and donors uh, here at Stanford, and this was true also at Rockefeller, are very savvy. Um, and they, they get excited by the ideas, but they also uh, wanna make sure that those ideas come to fruition. So they, they will ask for th those metrics um, and uh, you know, the, those signs of progress um, uh, as well. Um, but uh, I think what we've seen uh, you know, at Stanford, look at the past 20 years, number of very successful institutes and initiatives that there have been. Uh, and I'm very excited about the ones that we have in progress. So. Um, I think uh, this is a place where uh, we know how to go about this. Uh, it requires a lot of work. Um, it requires us to work together, um, but it's all about achieving uh, goals that we set for ourselves uh, and reassessing them and keeping moving forward. Yeah, your, your, uh, your audience might, know, might not know what a wonderful job you did at Rockefeller in only five years. Uh, you really, uh, 
I wouldn't say transform the place, but uh, you did a wonderful job and you left it uh, a, a better institution than it was when you came. And uh, everyone appreciates that very much. Now we have a very good new president, but uh, you really set, set a, a great tone. Well, th thank you, Jim. It, it was a, a great team effort, uh, just extraordinary people there and extraordinary people here at Stanford too. So I, I personally feel very privileged to have had that position and then now to be here as well. So Jim, we'll, um, we, we have several questions lined up, but we'll do one more. And uh, then we, you know, we we pretty much used up uh, our time that you've generously allotted to us. Uh, it's an interesting question. You have sat in a lot of neuroscience talks over the last uh, 20 years since you started Safari and now the collaboration on the global brain. You're a mathematician. You've seen, um, especially I think in the global brain, how mathematicians uh, or how neuroscientists incorporate mathematics in, into our work. What is your impression of, um, you know, the success or incisiveness of that? Is is some people say that neuroscience is still pre-theoretical, pre-mathematical in a sense? Um, should our goal be to get to something mathematical where we are really distilling principles that can be sort of written down in closed form? Is that how we know when we understand the brain, or are you more practically minded? We know when we're understanding the brain when we can really do something about autism, for example. What's, how, what's your reflections on mathematics and neuroscience in that sense? No, I, I think uh, neuroscience, uh, there's a lot of mathematics that can be in, and, and some is used in neuroscience. Uh, it, you're studying something very complex and uh, you could model it in, in various ways using mathematical models. Uh, I know you do that sometimes, uh, uh, definitely you do that. And it's, it's a way to uh, operate. It's a, it's, it's a way to understand if you can model something mathematically, uh, you've learned something. So I think mathematics uh, and neuroscience is, uh, is a very important tool and, and always will be. So uh, that's my answer. Good. I mean, I, I um, sometimes have undergraduates ask me, you know, what, what courses they should take, you know, like preparing themselves for graduate school in neuroscience or cognitive science or something. And I tell them the only regret I have for my undergraduate days is that I didn't take more math. I should have taken more math. <laughs> so whatever you're planning to do, uh, work, in, work in the mathematics and signal processing. Okay, so, well, go ahead. Jim, thank you so much for your time. And Mark, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make before I uh, wind us up for the day? Uh, 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 well, thank you. Yes, Bill. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for sharing this. And maybe I can just close by saying a few words to, to Jim. You know, as you know, Jim, we, we'd hope to host you on campus for this event. There are many Simons Foundation investigators here at Stanford. I know they would have been thrilled to meet you and to tell you about the incredibly exciting work that you made possible in their laboratories. Uh, of course, we had to postpone your visit due to the pandemic, but we very much hope to host you at Stanford in person in the near future, uh, once it's safe to do so. So, so it's a rain check right now. We'll, we'll have you back on campus. And I just wanna thank you again for uh, sharing your incredibly valuable uh, insights with us today and also for your many contributions to Stanford and also to science more generally over the years. So thank you so much, Jim. You're, you're very welcome. Stanford's a great place. My, my daughter lives not so far away. And uh, so I'll come back. Great. Wonderful. You'll, you'll get an invitation, Jim. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.